So the first thing I wanted to bring up with everyone is field day, which is next Wednesday. And it's not required for farmers market interns. And a couple of you already let me know that you wouldn't be joining me or, or us. And that's totally fine. But I just wanted to let you guys know, just a reminder, it's Wednesday in Grand Forks. So I'll be driving up from Fargo if anyone needs a ride you can let me know. Um, and it starts at 10 o'clock at Stable Days. There's a link online in the learning portal, portal about that so you guys can find out more. Uh, the second thing I want to tell you guys is that I printed out some little QR codes for you guys. These are going to be um, for people to scan and do the farms survey. So I have like a postcard size and then I will maybe turn off Zoom. You get the idea, a poster size as well. And so you guys can do those, hand those out or they're laminated so you can just show them to people. They can scan it and do the quick sur farm survey on, their, on your phone. So I'll be mailing those to you. You should get them by the end of the week. And then you can have those out at market and kind of start to collect responses for that. And then I'll email you the Facebook or a link for you to put on Facebook and Instagram as well. So just so that's on your radar. And then moving on into what the next week will look like and some homework assignments, I will pull up our learning portal really quickly. Um, so last week, I assigned these three sessions from Erica Kale. So make sure to watch those all before next week's session. Um, they're about 40 minutes each, 40 to 50 minutes. So it's not too bad. So make sure that you go through, watch those and write down if you have any questions because next week Erica will be joining us and she'll be doing one-on-one -on -one consultations with each intern to kind of come up with a social media plan for you guys and answer any questions you have about creating a social media presence or anything related to any of those sessions that I had you watch. The one-on-ones are gonna be 20 minutes each and they will go outside of our normal meeting time. So I have this document here and I will have you guys choose a time and then I will assign the remaining times to people who weren't able to make it. Um, so these are all gonna be on Monday, next Monday. So they start at 4 p.m. and they go till 6.30. And then our normal learning session will be from 6.30 to seven. So we'll have a short half hour class because most of the time will be spent with your one-on-ones. I will start with Josh, because I know you have other classes that day. And do you have a preferred time to sign up? I think I prefer session four. And then anyone else, go ahead and let me know if you have a preferred time. I'll take session three. OK. Thank you. And I'll do session six. <clears throat> All right, um, I'll do five. Okay, and then I will put Caleb and Jessica in here. Okay, so this is also linked for you guys in here so that you can double check. I'll email you guys to make sure and I'll make sure you guys have the Zoom link to that as well. So that's for next week. Another thing I'll ask you guys to do for next week, and this will be for the learning session that we're all in. So not for your individual consultation, but the, the week of August 1st to August 8th is National Farmers Market Week. So on Monday night, I'm just gonna have each person quickly share about what your market is doing for National Farmers Market Week. So um, it doesn't have to be like a super big event, but I'd like to see some sort of a giveaway. Maybe you have a couple of your vendors uh, donate a couple items, a, a pie or like something fun to give away and do that. Or you have um, 
I know last year, a couple interns did fun interactive events. Like they had a farmer bring in like a giant zucchini and people guessed the weight and whoever was closest, you know, got market tokens or some sort of fun extra thing to just kind of bring people to your market. So I'd like you guys to think about something this week and kind of plan that. And then next Monday, you will present about it so that you can do it in that week of August, August 2nd. Is there any questions on any of this so far? All right, I think that that is pretty much what I have. Field day is on Wednesday. I'll be mailing survey materials to you and then make sure that you watch all of those sessions with Erica Kale, come up with some sort of event or activity to do at market, not this coming week, but the one after for National Farmers Market Week. And then make sure to put the extra session with Erica on your calendar because it will be outside of regular class time. And then I just want to remind you guys that we do have this toolkit for National Farmers Market Week linked a couple weeks back. So that has lots of good promotional materials, some wording that you guys can use and some graphics you can post as well. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen and I think I am good to go as far as updates. And I want to introduce our guest speaker tonight, um, Clint Saunders, who is a photography well a professor but you also do photography <laughs> yeah um so he is with dakota college at botano and he's going to talk to you guys tonight about just kind of some of the basics of photography and creative image making i think yeah. i'll let you take it from here so what i've done in the past is different things i'm just talking about specifically like i go and find a bunch of like uh farmers market type photos and talk about them um and what's good and what's bad but i've got a, a lecture uh, one of the best things you can do to get attention and bring uh, people to your markets to your social media pages is photography whenever you've got whenever you make a post if you put a photo with it you're going to get twice as many views always so and my dogs are about to go to the dog park, so they're about to go nuts, just to warn you. <laughs> um, so the, um, so, but if you can take great photos, that's just going to be better. It just gives you better exposure, better, um, you know, people see them, they like them, et cetera, et cetera. So I've got a, a brief, uh, well, it's not brief, this is a 50 minute lecture, but it's interactive. Um, so we're going to be working together and, and we're going to talk about how to create good images. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. And I'm going to enlarge this and let me know if you can still see it or not after I hit enlarge. We can yep. still see it. Okay. So four steps to creative image making. Here we go. So I'm Clint Saunders. I've been a professional photographer for, I don't know, 22, 23 years. Um, I work in commercial photography. I do fine art photography. I'm a college professor. I've been teaching for about 15 years, um, photography and art. And I have to give my spiel here because it's part of any uh, guest lecturing that I do. Uh, for our college uh, we have a problem in photography as a career and uh, and the biggest we have a couple we have a bad reputation i get students all the time i get parents saying can you please tell my kid not to do photography it's bad um photography is actually a great career and it's actually a very lucrative career but most people don't realize that and the reason is because we have a high fail rate because a lot of people think that photography is this camera so my camera is about a seven thousand dollar camera it looks just like this one so people will go out and buy a 500 hundred dollar version of this it looks like that but it costs 500 bucks and now they're a professional photographer now that's how i started i have no problems with this i love that entrepreneurial spirit but they don't have any training so where they don't have any training they tend to fail um, it's really no different than going out and buying a riding lawnmower and starting a farm Woohoo! I got a tractor now. I'm going to start a farm. Yeah, it's literally no different. Or, or getting a really kick-ass plunger. So you start a plumbing company. You know, I got this great plunger and, I, and I'm good at using it too. So I'm just going to start a plumbing company. 
It makes no sense. Um, any other field, people go get training but when they want to start a profession. But photography, nope, they buy a camera, they're a pro now. And so we have a high fail rate um, for obvious reasons. The, the other reason we have a high fail rate is because it's an art and a trade. Because it's an art, every college offers a degree in photography. Um, but the problem is, is that's fine art photography. And so if you want to go into commercial photography and learn how to make money with photography, you're not going to learn that in a four year school. So when you go get a degree in photography, you're actually getting a, a bachelor's degree in general education um, with an emphasis in art, taking about three to four classes in photography and that's it. So we have a ton of people graduating from college with degrees in photography that have no idea how to do the job. They don't know how to run their gear. They don't know how to use the lighting. They have no idea what they're doing. So we have another high fail rate there. So what we do is we have a CT career and technical education program at Botno. I built this program in 2013, and we are currently ranked as the third best photography program in the nation, two-year photography program. So we even beat out uh, Academy of Art University, San Francisco. We beat out Yale. Um, so I'm pretty pumped about it. So what we do is it's all hands-on. We have a we run our entire studio as a business. And so that from the time our students come on the campus, they literally work for us as professional photographers. We learn how to do portrait photography. We learn how to do product photography. We learn how to do sports photography. We learn how to do fashion photography. We learn how to do food photography. All these shots are taken by students, by the way. And we make a bunch of money with our studio. We're one of, the, we're one of only two programs in North Dakota that actually make money with our CTE program. Uh, the other one is a culinary program out of um, Wapaton. And with the money we make in our studio, because we do commercial photography for the whole area, we take our students to Ireland every year. So we spend a week learning how to do outdoor photography in Ireland. We go there and that's where we do our outdoor photography class. So the whole program is extremely hands-on and we take 11 photo classes geared toward teaching you how to make a living in photography. So that's what our program's about. Fun fact, there are over 30 different careers in photography. Most people don't realize that. They think professional photographer, they think portraits but there's actually 30 different professional careers in photography. Um, I won't get into dual credit with you. So back onto the lecture. One of the great things about photography that I like is that it's both technical and creative. So it requires both halves of your brain. And <laughs> most people aren't good with, with, with that. Most people are good with one or the other. I, I know a lot of photographers that love this. They look at this diagram, they go, cool. And, and they get all into the gear and how stuff works and they can tell you how a pixel works, ick, all right? I'm not a technical person. I'm very much on the other side of my brain. So I'm very much on the creative side and I, I'm a visual artist. So I've got ideas and creativity going on all the time. So I struggle with that technical. But the problem is I can have all the creative ideas I want. If I don't know how to use my technical gear, I can't make those images. And I don't care how good you are at that gear. If you don't have a creative thought, you're not going to make great images. <laughs> so it really requires both sides of your brain. They've got to blend. And it's one of the things I love about photography is anybody, either side can be successful at it. If you can learn how to manage the other side. So most photography classes focus all on the technical. It's all about learning how to use those cameras right there. But you can take great photography with a smartphone. You can take great, I've seen amazing photography with homemade pinhole cameras. It's not about gear. So where you guys, especially with what you do, if you're out to farmer's markets, you're trying to promote your stuff and you've got your cell phone with you at all times and you can always, if you can learn how to take photos with this, you can, and it's not about the gear, it's about how to take a good photo. You can create some dynamic images and we don't have to focus on the technical because your phone does it all for you. You just push the button. So we are going to focus in this lecture on the creative side. So the creative side come join me on the creative side, is four steps. Four steps to creative photography. Subject, intent, principles of design, and post-production. First is subject. One of the most common misconceptions in photography is that we have to photograph pretty things. As a photography instructor, I am inundated with pictures of sunsets, pets, and flowers. Because we think, oh, I want to take a pretty picture. That's pretty. Okay, photography has nothing to do with subject matter. Good photography doesn't. Now, now, don't get me wrong. You know, a good subject's a good subject. <laughs> when you go to Lake Tahoe, you can't, it's hard not to get a good photograph. It's so beautiful there. Um, so definitely good subjects work. But my point is you can take a great photo out of any subject. So the first thing is finding subjects. Finding subjects can be difficult. And one of the reasons it's difficult because we have in our head, we have to find something pretty. When you learn how to see like a photographer, you can make any scene into a great photo without it being a pretty subject. 
I always tell my students that I can find three great photos in my sink every day. And one day I decided to prove it because they always laugh at it. So I literally, um, it's funny, it's long, sorry, I won't get into it, but I was in this horrible car accident, was almost killed and I was in a wheelchair for a few months and my camera gear all got destroyed in the car accident. And I'm in my wheelchair and my new camera arrived and I unpacked that sucker and I wheeled my wheelchair into the bathroom, <laughs> propped up on my elbows and took three photos in my sink just to prove to my students that you can take three, three great photos in a sink. All right, so what you're gonna do right now, and we don't need to take three minutes with this, however long it takes, is I want you to find just a simple, I don't care what it is subject that's just next to you, something that you can take pictures of. Everybody ready? All right, let's move on. Step two is intent. Intent is the most important part of the image making process. And most people don't get this. As artists and photographers, you are visual communicators. If you're gonna communicate visually, then first you gotta decide what you wanna say. And this is very important for you guys where, you, where you've got something, where, where we're talking about marketing, you've got to have a, a strong idea on what you want to communicate to your audience. So it starts with intent. Now, this can be challenging even for advanced photographers. So in this class, we're going to examine four basic intents to get you started. Depictive, expressive, statement, and formal. Depictive intent is showing what a subject looks like. This is what 99.9% .9 of people do when they take photos and what most non-professional photographers do. You go, oh, that's pretty, click. Oh, look at that one, click. Oh, that's neat, click. And your only intent is to show people what it looked like, what's in front of you. Next is an expressive intent. An expressive intent is trying to express a mood or emotion. It's trying to have your, when your viewer looks at it, to connect with the image on an emotional level. And we tend to think, well, me, because I'm an artist and we're all, you know, deep and weird, um, like to listen to Pink Floyd, but we always think, you know, dark, moody images, but happy, feel good. This is a lot of marketing, okay, an expressive intent. I need to make these pictures look alive and fun so that I can draw people in. So that would be an expressive intent. That's your intent there. A statement intent is telling a story or making a statement. So my intent when I take this picture is to tell a story. Typically, if you're going to tell a story, you're going to need props and or background, something that tells us where we're at, what's going on. A formal intent is creating an image that is purely about form or aesthetics. It's about line, shape, color, texture, etc. Something you might see in an art gallery or as decor. You might not even know what the subject is. We might take some really dramatic close-ups of some peppers and we might not even know what they is, but they're aesthetically pleasing. They're really pretty. And those make great art and decor um, for what we're doing. They're also very good for attention grabbing images when you're doing marketing pieces on Facebook and that because they're pretty people. Oh, that's really neat. And so that'll get attention. Now, please note that these intents will often overlap and that's OK. The goal of intent is figuring out why you're taking the photograph, because if you know what you want to say when you take the photograph, it's going to dictate a whole lot of things. You're going to all the decisions you're going to make when you take that photograph so that you can make a stronger image. Step three is principles of design. And principles of design, we have six steps. So now there's many basic principles of design in art, including balance, contrast, dominance, movement, rhythm, scale, white space, texture, line, shape, color, value, pattern, consistency of variety and unity. Now, when you discuss principles of design for photography, we're referring to the design elements we apply when creating or designing a photograph. And if any of you've ever studied art, you'll often hear the seven basic principles of design for art. Those change with every type of art. <laughs> if you Google, what are the principles designed for art? You'll, you'll come up with, oh, seven. But every seven, you'll see multiple sevens that have different things on them. When you think principles design, you're designing a photograph. You're designing an image. So what things need to go into that design to make it successful? Background, framing, angle, basic composition or balance, lighting, and depth of field. Those are the, the, the six things that are going to help us create strong images. The background is the area behind or around the subject. Things to consider when choosing a background, aesthetics. Is the background aesthetically pleasing? Does it enhance your subject, the bottom photo? The background's aesthetically pleasing, it enhances the photo, it really puts dominance on the subject. Is the background busy? Does your background contain a lot of information that is distracting from your subject, the top photo? There's a lot going on there, so it gets very busy. Relevance. If the background is busy, like in the top photo, 
it has a lot of information. Is the information relevant to the subject? If you're photographing a stand at a farmer's market and you've got and you want to show how big of the crowd is behind it because you want to show that a lot of people come to this, then that background becomes very relevant to that. If you're trying to focus on that zucchini we talked about earlier, we don't want a lot of stuff in the background that's going to distract from it because we want to show the zucchini. If you can't move your subject, then you move around it <laughs> until you find a good background. If you can move your subject, you just put it wherever you want it. Hey, that's a good background for this, and you, and you do that. Um, otherwise, you got to walk around it if it's stationary. So what we're going to do right now is whatever your subject is, you have to find in your area, and you can you get three minutes, I'll time it, to, to, that's a good background for it. Okay? What's a good background for that subject? Preferably something not distracting or something that helps tell a story. All right. That's time. So let's move along. And I just remembered something. Don't let me forget this. The last time I did this class, we actually did the whole lecture on how to photograph food with your smartphones. So when I send this lecture to you, I'll send that one as well. So it's just a PDF. You guys can look through that. It's got great information in it. All right. So framing. Framing is the information included of the frame of the photograph and its orientation and format. Passive framing is when you show a large amount of background around your subject, the top image. Active framing is when you show a smaller amount of area around your background or background around your subject. That's active. And then there's close up where you fill the frame with the subject. So here I've, I've got for all these samples, you'll notice I'm using a fire hydrant. It's a very simple fire hydrant. Um, it's not attractive. <laughs> it's not aesthetically pleasing. It's just on the corner of my street here. And I did this assignment for this. So there's a three different types of framing there. Framing orientation is the direction of the frame. Vertical is up and down. Horizontal is left to right, side to side. Now, and uh, in photography, we use the terms vertical and horizontal when discussing the orientation. When you're doing printing, you'll often hear the terms landscape and portrait. Now we don't use the land, we don't use the terms landscape and portrait in photography because those are genres in photography, portrait photography and landscape photography. So we'll always say vertical for up and down, horizontal for sideways. The format is the shape of the frame. You've got a rectangular shape, which is your standard sensor size. Then you've got a square, which is a medium format sensor, which you can also do on your smartphones. Uh, and then you got panoramic, which is the long narrow uh, frames that you can do. Uh, phones also, if you photograph in Snapchat, it photographs them the shape of your phone, which is a somewhat of a panoramic format also. So what I'd like you to do is take your subject and I'd like you to photograph it with a horizontal frame, a vertical frame, a passive frame where you show a lot of background, a active frame where you show just a little bit of background and a tight frame where you get close up. So we'll go three minutes again. And, we're, and I'll leave this slide up so you can see it and just all hit every all five of those things. <clears throat> all right. Next slide here. Angle. Angles can make a huge difference in a successful image. Take the time to examine your subject from a variety of angles to determine which angle is going to work the best to show what your subject and match your intent. Does your subject look better from the left? the right, the front, the back, the top, the bottom. Also pay attention to the psychology of angles. A high angle shooting down on a subject can imply that you are above the subject or better than the subject, or that the subject is beneath you somewhere. A low angle shooting up at an, a, a subject has the opposite effect. We call it the hero shot. It makes the subject look bigger than life and important. And so it's, it's, it's heroic. Very common in food photography. Choosing the correct angle, is going to be determined by your intent and uh, your subject. Not all subjects are going to look good from the top, the left, the bottom, the right. It, you know, the idea is to find the best angle for the subject. Now, keep in mind while we're doing this, we have to remember all the other things. So, as we're looking at the angles, we also oh, it looks really good from this angle, but don't forget what's in the background. <laughs> okay, because if if we've got a great angle, but now the background's distracting, then we that's not what we want. Or you know what? Do we want to show a lot of background, do we want a close-up? Which one's going to work best? A tip, a technical issue with phones, I'm going to give you two tips here. Um, one, when you tap on the screen, it'll focus where you tap. And when, and it'll also give you a little square with a little sun beside it, which you can raise up and down for exposure to make it darker and brighter. 
never ever pinch zoom. Oh, I like that, but I need to get closer. And you pinch zoom. That literally absolutely destroys the image quality of a smartphone picture. You're done when, when, when you pinch zoom, you end up with about a one inch by a one inch picture. So if you want to blow it up for social media, or especially if you want to print it, you can't. The image quality just gets ruined. So you always, sadly, with smartphones, you always have to get closer. So I'm going to go three minutes again. Photograph your subject from a high angle, a low angle, the left side, the right side, straight on. Uh, try some different framing. Try horizontal and vertical. Might even look at a square, um, maybe even a panorama. But look around and see if you can find an angle that really makes your subject look good. I have been taking pictures of a plant that a house plant that I have, and it, it's kind of fun. I, I have lots of pictures of my plants in my phone already, but now I have many more. Many more. And one of the things I highly recommend a smartphone photography, I teach a whole class in smartphone photography. Uh, I just wrote it last year. It took me a whole year to write it, but I love the class. And, um, but it's making folders, making albums on your phone. Mm -hmm. And saving things into those albums now sadly they also they're always in your recent folder so if you create an album and copy it there if you delete it out of that album it also deletes off your phone period so you, you still have to have the recents but when you got to find something you, you, oh I, we took this great picture in italy what year was that and you're scrolling through ten thousand pictures trying to find it if you just mm -hmm. got this album called italy 2005 and there's 50 pictures and it is so much faster to find those images yeah that's what we do week one in that class. I make the students set up folders. <laughs> um, do you use Google Photos at all? I don't know what, if you're an Apple person, but I Google Photos has some like auto tagging options. So you can type okay. in cars right. and it will pull up everything that it oh, has identified cool. is a car. And it doesn't catch everything, but um, it is handy to it, whatever that algorithm right. says is that. So you can be like mountains, you know, to try and find pictures of mountains. So, right. And they probably then you're, they would probably have the option to also tag your photos with tags as well. Oh, there's the alarm. How do you stop it? Stop that. Okay. All right. Composition and balance, ooh, here we go. Composition is the arrangements of the elements within the frame of the photograph. As you're noticing, every time you change an angle, look at a background, there's a whole lot of different stuff in the photograph. One of the biggest problems, mistakes people make with photography is just like finding pretty subjects is we're too focused on the subject. So we're not paying attention to what's going on around it. And, and quite often you got the great subject and there's all this junk around it that makes it unattractive or takes away from it. And there's actually some, you know, really funny things that happen too, <laughs> accidentally in these situations. So in composition, you're paying attention to every element in that frame and making it work to balance with your subject. Balance, we, we discuss balance more in detail in an upcoming lecture. You guys won't see that, sorry. But for the base, sake of basic composition, we're referring to have an equal spacing around your subject, the left image. The photo shouldn't appear left, right, top, bottom, heavy, et cetera. If you look at the image on the right, we got a vertical frame and the image is shoved over to the side and it feels like it's tipping over. It's right heavy. There isn't enough, it's not balanced. So the image on the left, we've got this uh, approximately the same amount of space all the way around that photo so it's got better balance the grid there's a photo grid nine rectangles used in a variety of ways to create a strong composition in photography your cameras all have these usually some cameras you find it in camera settings on apple and some other cameras you have to go to your actual settings tab outside of the camera and then go to camera and you can turn on that photo grid and this gives you this photo grid, which is unbelievably help, helpful for composition. Um, the photo grid is used in a lot of ways. If you want to get advanced about it, you can look it up. There's lots of advanced ways to use these photo grids to get perfect compositions. We're going to talk about just a few basic compositions, which will instantly give you stronger photographs. The first mistake people tend to make is they shove your subject dead center in the middle of the photograph. Now, as on the last slide, I just said we want it centered for balance, right? <laughs> well, we do. 
But if it's only in that center square, right now, over 80% of our subject is in that center rectangle. We've got six rectangles that are completely empty and two with barely anything in it. So it's boring. A, it's boring. B, it's, there's no dominance on our subject. Um, it's just, oh, okay, it's fire hydrant. <laughs> there's, there's no balance there. And it's, it's not uh, well composed. The easiest thing you can do with basic composition is just fill the frame. Fill the frame with your subject. And when filling the frame, make sure you balance it. We have an equal amount on all four sides when you fill the frame. When shooting a vertical subject, here's another big mistake people make. When shooting a vertical subject, people often tend to hold their cameras this way to take pictures. Well, if you've got a vertical subject, then you end up doing this. So turn that camera vertical. And then you can fill the frame with your subject. If you've got a horizontal subject, then turn your camera horizontal and fill the frame with the subject. Equal amount of balance on all four sides. Dominance, this creates dominance to the subject. Right now, our subject is literally in all nine rectangles. All nine rectangles have subject in it. So we're creating dominance with the subject and making the background minimal. The next thing you can do is rule of thirds. So if we are photographing a vertical subject and, and shooting it horizontally, we don't put it in the center, we move it over to a third line, a left third line or a right third line. Now what happens is we have one third subject, two thirds empty, and it balances, balances each other visually. So if you remember when we shot vertical and put that over on the right side using a third, it felt like it was tipping over because there's not enough empty space to balance that. But when we shoot it horizontal and put that on a third line, it's got really nice balance. It feels balanced. And it's, it's an attractive image. It's, got, it's a nice composition. And our subject is in six out of the nine squares, rectangles. So we've got really nice balance. We've still got dominance on our subject. When using rule of thirds, you can also put something in the other third. So right now in the two thirds. So like right now, my subject is on the left third running off the bottom. So I found something in the background on the right third running off the top. And that creates what we call an asymmetrical balance. Those two items balance each other quite nicely. Now, as you can see, I don't need anything over on that right side for balance, but putting it there just gives you another option for balance. So if you've got an empty space up there and you can fill it, that can often work. As a general rule, when shooting a horizontal frame, you're gonna use right and left thirds. If you're shooting a vertical frame, you're gonna use top and bottom thirds. Never use right and left thirds on a vertical frame or it feels like it's tipping over. Another great thing you can do is use multiple thirds. So if you can get your subject intersecting two third lines, you're gonna create a very strong balance and composition in your frame. And the picture on the right, they got a bonus because they've got that light up on the top left two thirds and then the face, which is gonna be the main subject on the bottom right two thirds, both those intersect in those two third sections and they balance each other really nicely asymmetrically. And then the, uh, the dog on the left there has got that really nice intersecting those two third lines on the right and the bottom, creates a really nice balance all around it. All right, so we're gonna use, use your grids and we're gonna fill the frame with your subject. So it's in all nine rectangles. Remember if it's a vertical subject, shoot a vertical. If it's horizontal, shoot a horizontal. <clears throat> then you're going to try using the top and bottom third lines. <clears throat> so if you've got a horizontal subject, shoot it vertical and use the top and bottom third lines and see what happens. If you've got a horizontal subject, shoot it um, with the right and left thirds. Or excuse me, if you've got a vertical subject, shoot horizontal with right and left thirds. That makes sense? And vertical or horizontal trying to use the intersecting third lines. So I'll start the timer and you give that one a try. Use those third lines on your phone. And remember, the easiest way to have a balanced composition is just fill the frame. Fill the frame with your subject. If you remember from the earlier slide, that's called active framing. All right, let's move along. Lighting. Lighting is everything in photography. The term key is girl. A technique employed in the visual arts to represent light and shadows as they define three-dimensional objects. In other words, light creates all the form in an image. Line, color, shape, everything is defined by the light. If you look at the, all the images on the right here, 
light and shadows are what create the shape of everything. And it doesn't matter what the subject is, your job with lighting is to have it hit the subject at an angle that creates the form of that subject in a flattering way. And light can create un unattractive shadows as well. So you have to be careful and highlights. Lighting angles. Flat lighting is when the light source comes from the camera or right behind you, the pop-up flash, the flash on your camera. So that fills your subject with light. The top image on the right there, that egg is just filled with light. So you get no shadows. It actually gets rid of the shadows. Directional lighting is when the lighting is coming from an angle and that creates shape. That's gonna give it highlights, a gradient, a shadow on the other side, and that's gonna give it volume. So that gives it depth and creates volume. Directional lighting is typically preferred as it brings out the shapes of the subject better than flat lighting. All examples on this page were done with directional lighting. Uh, the fire hydrant's just kind of top lighting, but it was also overcast, so it's very flat. But the others, very directional lighting were, was used to create those images and bring out that shape. All right, we're not gonna, we're not gonna worry about this one because we're gonna move on. Well, let's do it, what the heck. Take your subject, if you can, if you got a lamp or a window, or you can shut off the light in the room and use just the window or vice versa, and move your subject by that light source and, and move it around that light source and see how the light source changes the shape of the subject. And so that you've got a shot of your subject with flattering lighting. I have a quick question for you. Yes. Um, okay, so in my phone, there is an option to do a grid that's the three by three. And then I also have a golden ratio option. That's also a three by three, but it yeah. has a yeah. little it's like rectangle in the it. middle. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the golden ratio is something if you want to, that's why I talked about, there's lots of different advanced compositions mm -hmm. that you can use with the grid. If you want to Google that one, it's fairly simple. Okay. Um, to understand, but you Google it so you can see some um, visual examples so that you know what you're trying to do um, yeah. with that golden ratio there. And it's, it's more, it's more or less a, a it's more or less a uh, using two intersecting third lines ratio. Okay. It's kind of what it is, but go ahead and look it up because there's some, it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. I, I know I've definitely heard the term before, but I was just interested that it was an option yeah for I, a grid. i've never seen that on a phone so that's really cool you've got that google phone yeah yeah google's been putting some time into um their image stuff i know i've had students with a google phone that really love them yeah yeah i got this phone for the photos because yep. it yeah it does it it gives you hints too like it'll say try moving back to improve focus or try another angle to like help you out to get better photos. So it's really interesting. I'm afraid I'd have to shut that off. Yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, no, for someone who knows what they're doing. Don't tell me what to do, Siri. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely could see, but how that would. No, that's really that... cool. No, that's awesome. <laughs> A very handy feature when you're learning. Mm -hmm. And there is an option to turn it off, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there'd have to be. Just let me take the picture. All right. Lighting is fun to play with. Depth of field is the last one. Well, almost. Depth of field is the area in the photograph is measured by physical space that's in focus. So if I have a small depth of field, Whatever I focus on, anything within this space of that is going to be in focus. So like, for example, if you're taking a portrait, I'm, you're gonna focus on the person's nose, okay? So if your depth of field is only this much, then it, that much is gonna be in focus coming away from my nose, uh, toward the camera and away, that's how much is gonna be in focus. Now, the bigger that depth of field gets, the more that's in focus, both directions from your subject, toward the camera and away. Does that make sense? So that's what depth of field is. Now, when you get this depth of field blur, it's called a bokeh blur, which is just gorgeous. It's very aesthetically pleasing. It's also almost impossible to get with a smartphone. <laughs> it's caused by the aperture, the size of the opening of your lens. So if I'm using one of my medium format cameras, those things have huge openings. 
So the bigger the, and, and it's a physical thing. So the bigger the opening that is, I can get a depth of field of less than an inch. I mean, literally centimeters. With macro lenses, that's what macro lenses do. You get a depth of field of literally less than a centimeter. Um, you can photograph a fly's eyes are in focus and their wings are blurry. You know, that small of a depth of field. And increasing the depth of field just increases how much is in focus. So if we've got a background like this and I don't like it and, and I want to get rid of it, I can blur it out with depth of field blur. Now, you can't control your aperture on your phones. There are some apps out there, some pro camera apps that allow you to set it but it's not actually changing the physical aperture of your phone. It's just doing an algorithm that's going to try to blur the background in the algorithm, not in reality. Not, it's not a visual thing or, uh, uh, excuse me, a physical thing. So what we can do with smartphones is it's, it's about physical distance. So the closer you get to your subject, you can blur the background more. If your background's a long way from your subject, you can blur it more. If you just hold up your thumb and the, the, you move it really close to your eye and move it further, you can see the difference between when it's out here, my thumb and that wall are in focus. The closer I get it, the more that background starts to blur or my thumb starts to blur. So physical distance is what affects it. So if you can get the background a long way from your subject and get close to your subject, you can vocal blur the background with your phone. And this is one we're not gonna do the assignment for because it's tough to do, especially if you don't have a lot of space, but it's just something to think about. The fourth step is post-production. Photography is a two-step process. First is image capture, the second is post-production. Post-production is an import, as important in photography as it is getting the image on the phone in the first place. Um, in the film days, nobody saw the negatives. You just saw the pictures. So everybody thought, oh, that's a great picture. That picture was printed, which means it went through a post-production process. And a printer put that in an enlarger and made a print of it and then took it out in the light and wrote all over it. Burn this in for two seconds, dodge that out for a second, add a little vignette here, add a little bit of color here. Okay, then we go in the dark room and we dodge and we burn and we add filters and we turn things on and we turn things off and we take it back out in the light and we make more notes and we go back in. We call it a recipe. It could take three hours to make one great print. And it looked nothing like the original negative. <laughs> okay it's printing because cameras do not have the optics that our eyes have so our goal with post-production is to make it look real because your camera can't now in modern day with the digital camera there's all kinds of algorithms that happen in these phones and these cameras that make that more possible they're getting more and more and more real but they're still don't match your op optics for your eyes have you ever experienced that it was so pretty but i just couldn't seem to get a picture that showed it that's because the camera can't that happens in post-production, okay? Now, digital comes out and suddenly people realize, oh, that's in post-production, so then they think it's cheating. Oh, yeah, he thinks he's a great photographer, but it's all Photoshop. <laughs> that's the second half of the image process. So don't be afraid of post-production. On your phones, there's an app that goes with um, every phone I've ever had um, called Snapseed, and it is a free post-production app, and it's incredible. It's a power horse. It does everything. Now, if you want to, there's a app, it's called Tune Image. So Snapseed is the app. There's an option called Tune Image. That's just brightness, contrast, saturation, the little bit of some adjustment we do to make the photo look more real. Those tiny little things to overcome the camera's imperfections. That's it. That's called basic post-production. But it's also got a ton of other filters and stuff you can play with if you want to go for more stylized looks. So I strongly recommend Snapseed. It's free and it's fun. Snapshots. Taking a photo with no thought for principles of design. Simply raise the camera, point and shoot, click and done. Oh, that was cool. Click, move along. This is the most common method of photography for most beginning photographers. This style is a depictive intent because the goal is to take a photo of, to capture what something looks like with no other thought. This is often referred to as a snapshot aesthetic and it certainly has its place in photography and photographic history. However, the most common place for this aesthetic is in family photo albums, which is fine. You know, when I'm on vacation with my family, I'm snapshotting away. You know, it's, that's what it's about. Um, that's my intent. Um, but it's not how we create professional photographs. We want to create images. As photographers, our goal is to create an image instead of taking a snapshot. To create an image, you start with your intent. What do I want to say? Then you look at and apply the six principles of design and then post-production to communicate your intent. When using this creative process, I often pre-visualize my shot and I literally write it down and take little notes. And then I go out and I make that happen. Now, please understand, 
not all successful images have been taken with this with an intent okay not, uh, there's a million amazing 10 million amazing photographs out there that the photographer had no intent in mind but the more you can learn to create with intent the more control you have over your image making process the more successful your images will be on a whole let's take a look at a depictive intent this has a depictive intent i it's just show the person what the show us what the person looks like so does this most portraits are a depictive intent but with this this is a beautiful photo it doesn't have a snapshot of setting nothing wrong with this photo but it doesn't look like a professional photo does that make sense so we start with the intent of depictive but i go ahead and i think what's my background oh by the way i'm going to show you all four intents with a, with people and see how we can take a person different people but a person same type of subject and create completely different photographs based on what we want to say so I, I think about my background. I want it to be outdoors. I want it to be aesthetically pleasing, um, but I don't want it to distract from my subject. My framing, I want it active. I want to minimize that background because I don't want to distract from my subject. My angle is straight on. My basic composition is fill the frame. My lighting is a slight direction with soft shadows. My depth of field is shallow. I want a strong bokeh blur. My post-production is to soften the skin and brighten the eyes. That's it. An expressive intent, remember, is when you want to express a mood or an emotion. So here, uh, the mood was a depression. So the background, I'm using an indoor large empty room. The framing is passive. I want to show a large empty space. That's going to communicate that idea. I'm using a high angle looking down on that subject. Remember, communication, uh, psychological communication with angles. Basic composition is rule of thirds. I'm using a right and a left, uh, bottom and a right third there. Uh, the light is directional, dr dramatic, creating heavy shadows. Post-production is black and white with a vignette. So all of this stuff is pre-thought out before you even take the shot because you know what you want to say. Statement of 10 is when you want to tell a story or make a statement. If you're going to tell a story, you need to have props. You need to have environment because otherwise it's just depictive. So for this one, uh, the statement is digital photographers need to find time to balance time between taking photos and doing post-production. It's a huge problem in today's photography market. Most professional photographers are buried in post-production uh, because the, you know, the, the, the after part, it's just insane. So here's a self-portrait, um, a camera on each side of the huge computer monitor trying to balance that out. All the stuff in the background tells us about the subject. We see the camera gear, we see art, we see art dummies. So we know that the, uh, the, the person is an artist and a photographer. We see artwork in the background. We see the cameras and the monitor. We assume they're a photographer doing digital work. So all this stuff is pre-thought out, same subject. We've got a person, but instead of depictive, instead of expressive, we're telling a story. Formal, a formal intent, creating an image that is purely about form. Line, shape, color, texture, etc. Something you might see in an art gallery or as decor. So, as a figure study, we do we use three figures here. First was an S curve, second was hands, and the third was muscles. Background, we want it simple and clean and not distracting. A white background for the S curve, black background for the other. Angle is going to be straight on for all of these. Um, the framing is active. We're filling the frame with the subject as much as possible. Basic composition is fill the frame. Lighting is directional. We want dramatic, heavy shadows. We want to bring out the form. It's all about form. We want to bring out that form. Depth of field is large. I don't want to blur on this. I want to see every bit of texture in those hands, in those veins in the arms, the muscle tones. I want to see all those things. Uh, Post-production was black and white. So in this intent, I showed several examples because most people don't understand that the many different ways we can approach a human with form and subject. Multiple intents. All images have multiple intents. All images depict something. <laughs> so they all have a depicted part. They all have form because everything's shape, everything has shape. So there's always a bit of a form. And many images are expressive. And many images tell a story. However, most images have a dominant intent. And this intent should be clear when you're creating with intent. The sample image on the right is a very strong formal image, and it would be easy to assume that it's a formal intent. However, the story of the mother's hands comforting, protecting, and loving the newborn's baby's feet is clearly the intent of the photograph, despite having strong formal qualities and a little bit of an expressive quality too, because it's kind of a moody photograph. So in this sample image, the strong formal aspects of the photo are, bring, are being used to strengthen the statement intent. So. 
the reason for this. If you start out with an intent, you immediately know what you want to say. If you're at a farmer's market and your intent is to tell a story, then you're going to need some background. You're going to need some environment. You're going to need some props. You're going to want that farmer holding that world record hold zucchini. You know what I mean? We need the props. We need the story. But if your intent was formal, I want to make an art piece out of that zucchini, you're going to photograph it totally different. Does that make sense? So if you can start with an intent, it's going to dictate how you approach the photograph and everything from that point on. So for this assignment, I found a subject that wasn't necessarily aesthetically pleasing, this fire hydrant. There it is. There's a snapshot of it. But then I decided to try and use all four intents. A depictive intent. I'm showing what it looks like, but this is an attractive photograph. It has a professional quality. It's interesting, especially compared to that. You see what I'm saying? So because same subject, completely different image. Same subject with an expressive intent, expressing this ominous, eerie mood. Same subject with a statement. The statement is telling a story. Um, this is like an advertisement. Water is fire hydrants protecting your home when you're not there. You know what I mean? Type of a thing. It's got this story going on. So it's a statement and can be used in an advertisement. A formal intent. You don't even know what this is. You have no idea that this is a fire hydrant. This is just a scratched up bolt. It could be on anything. It could be on my lawnmower. You know what I mean? So that's the formal intent. It's not even about the subject. It's about the form of the subject. So you basically have been doing this all along on your phone. You've been creating these different things. My, what I challenge you to do next, we don't have time to do it now because this class is over, but would be to, and again, I'm going to send you these PDFs, do this, try to this assignment, take an everyday object, whatever you just did, and see if you can create four really good images of it based on different intents. And if you can do it with a water bottle, you can do it at a farmer's market. <laughs> know what I mean? So that's it. And I'll send you these slideshows. I'll send you this one and the one on food um, the, for food photography, because it's that's a really good one um, for the farmer's market group. All right. Any questions for me? Now, what we'd like to do next is you're going to get this slideshow on the next one on food. And I would like you over the next few weeks to take some images and play with them, think about these things, try to apply them and see if you can create some really strong images. And then the next time I'm here, I'll, I'll critique your images. So you will all send those images in and I'll get them all ready and I'll put them up on the screen and I'll talk about the pluses and minuses and how to improve them, what's working, what's not, that type of thing. So you can get feedback um, on the uh, direct images that you're creating. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to add we will. Yeah, so we will be having Clint back on August 23rd. So I think that's about four weeks. So every weekend at the market, you can start to think about some of these things and play with. Um, yeah, play with the angles and the composition and the lighting and all this stuff. And so I will give you dates specifically of when I want some of those photos back. But just start to play with it and see what happens and see uh, see how it works. It's fun. Well, I think so. <laughs> yeah, no, I I had fun just, you know, yeah, playing with angles and stuff. Like I said, I was taking pictures of a house plant. So well, it's cool yeah. when you can suddenly get in a great image of a house plant. Okay, and if you guys have questions on anything, you can email me and I can forward those questions along. Yeah. Um, like I said, you said we are running out of time, so I'm going to end the class today, but go ahead and email me, keep this in mind, keep taking photos, and I'll get some details of when I want some photos back to you in the next week or so. So. And I'll send right. you those PDFs as soon as we log off. Yep, I'll upload those onto the portal so you guys have access to them as well. All awesome. right. Well, thank you so much, Clint, and everyone yeah, have a great week and have fun at your markets this weekend. Bye.